Uh, yeah, 40. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, great to be here. Great to, to listen to Jeremy's talk. I, I have to, Wow, that was great. Thank you so much. That was just awesome. Um, really, really uh, inspiring. Um, so uh, l let's just get started right away because I've got a lot of slides, okay? So let me just start ripping through these. This is my disclaimer saying that everything I'm going to say today uh, will probably change tomorrow. So uh, because of... So the great work that Jeremy's doing, the great work that Steve Steve's doing, and good. Steve wants me to stop, stay in one place. I like to walk back and forth. Steve <laughs> wants me to stay in one place. So anyway, um, what is smart? Smart is silver modified art, atraumatic restorative treatment. So atraumatic restorative treatment was uh, invented in 1996 by Dr. Joe Franken in in England, right? Steve is British. So no, he's Europe. It was done in Africa and Southeast Asia originally. But he's a British dentist. No. Oh, okay. South <laughs> South Africa. Um, I believe Dutch. Dutch. Oh, yeah, Dutch. Dutch. Okay, yes. interesting. No needles. Some caries are always removed. Then uh, glass ionomer cement is applied, and then you're done. Okay. So in 1998, the WHO recommended that art recommended art as the first line of treatment for primary teeth worldwide. That's pretty amazing, WHO. And that was in 1998, okay. So principles behind SMART, bacterial diseases of the human body, including dental disease, cannot be treated effectively by surgical means only. Mm -hmm. uh, so when the treatment goal before any other goal is the establishment of a measurable reduction in the disease, Surgical management is contraindicated. Options for medical management of caries, apply silver diamine fluoride three times once a month for three months, apply silver diamine fluoride twice a year. After you're sure you've arrested the caries, then apply glass ionomer over it, that's smart, or apply silver diamine fluoride only once, then immediately seal it with glass ionomer cement, and that's also smart. So you, you can see there's a variety of ways of doing it. Which is the most correct way? It all depends upon clinical setting, availability of air water suction, patient recall reliability, operator comfort level, and operator training or lack of training. I am an itinerant dentist that treats, yeah. Is that high up here over here? Okay, this way. Who wants to move over this the podium? Right. How's that? At the podium yeah, or close to the podium? Podium. Okay. Thanks. I hate the podium. You don't hear I'm going to do this. There you go. How's that? Perfect. All right. So, um, <laughs> I, I, I'm an itinerant dentist. Um, I have uh, an itinerant patient base in the many states that I work in and in the many, many places. But, but I mean, you know, and I say they're itinerant because, you know, they're, they're Medicaid patients. And you know what they're like sometimes, they just don't show up. The biggest problem in treating the Medicaid population, population is, is the no-show uh, patient, which is uh, prevalent in, within that population. But, I'm a no-show dentist. I mean, I, I I'm not there all the time, you know. I I, I show when I'm when I'm uh, scheduled to work, but it's on a part-time basis and in in, uh, in in different offices all over. So uh, I found that it was necessary for me to go to the option number four, applying silver diamine fluoride once and then immediately sealing it with glass ionomer's mat, and and then. I, I did that out of necessity, you know. Uh, necessity is the mother of invention, and that's why I invented that. So out of necessity, I did it, and then the more I did it, the more I realized how effective it was. And I was seeing, you know, clinical effectiveness, and I said, wow, why don't I do this more often, uh, or, and why don't I uh, uh, support others doing it also? So, uh, oops, what do I do? So can you go back? Sure. Sorry. Yeah. You are, well, well the, the, the point is that it, it depends upon your comfort level. It depends upon your clinical settings. It depends upon uh, it, whether you have air water uh, uh, suction, whether you, your, your, your reliability of your patient base. But most importantly, your comfort level. I mean, you have to get to the point where you feel comfortable doing whichever protocol you're doing and then advance from there with what you're seeing clinically. Well, these are the results. This is working in my hands. That you know, I, I or I don't feel comfortable doing it in one visit or, or whatever. So, 
uh, you know, uh, applying silver dimethyl chloride three times once a month for three months, that's all fine and good until we, we say, let's go to Africa. Okay, unless they're dropping to Nairobi, and now we got these Maasai people, you know, the ones with the big spears, and they're walking three days to get to our venue, and they're gonna be there, for, and we're gonna be there for exactly one day, we're never gonna see these people again. You know, how, how are we gonna treat the children that have the decay? Well, I think we should do that one, one application in the morning, one application at, at, at just before lunch or just after lunch after we give them toothbrushes, and one application as they're going to bed, and then we're never gonna see them again. And we're gonna get on an airplane or we're gonna get in a, uh, you know, in a Jeep and we're gonna go to the next village. Okay, so three applications in one day. I mean, we have to be uh, creative in the way in which we do these. Now, of course, I, if I were doing that and, and I was seeing active carries, I would be doing SMART. I actually like Gore and that was never a mess. Right. Not because it's a drag and it's bath time. And you bet. We've been trying to do the other three and it's like, I can't even keep track. Thank you. That's me. So here, here we have a, a guy, and I, I, and I don't know your, your circumstances, your clinical circumstances. Maybe they're similar to mine. But I found the exact same thing, which is why I do SMART. Yeah. 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 Number four really works. OK. Uh, regardless of the option you choose, the idea is to immediately put out the fire, control the disease first. Then treat the symptoms of the, of the disease when time, money, and behavior <coughs> allow. That's my mantra. Treat the disease first, and treat all of the disease when you see it. And I don't care if it's a recall day, I don't care if they were here to do tooth number A, and Dr. John, you know, parents expect you to do a pulp and crown on number A, are you kidding me? I've got eight other cavities, I'm doing smart on everything. I'm gonna treat this all the day, control the disease first, first and foremost, and I train the parents to come along with that. So it's an educational thing, I have my can't speech, you know, and they get it. I've never had a mom who didn't get it. So logic tells us that art can be more effective if we modify it with silver. Meta-analysis for one surface art shows great initial response but falls off after three years and is worse for multi-surface art. So art works, we know that. But the lo logic tells us that glass ionomer and fluorite varnish can be made more effective when we combine, com uh, when combined with silver diamond fluoride. So all studies show that silver diamond fluoride alone, glass ionomer alone, and fluoride varnish alone are insufficient for multiple surface carries arrest. So combination therapy works better than single agent therapy. To improve results, silver and fluoride were included in silver diamine fluoride as a formula. It's also logical to, to conclude that silver diamine fluoride and glass ionomer combined will give better results than either alone because both are antibacterial remineralizing and primarily water-based, as is a tooth water-based. So they're synergistic, they work together. Silver diamine fluoride alone leaves certain details unaddressed. Silver diamine fluoride alone leaves a food trap, cavitation. Class two lesions often leave patients with a toothache that isn't a toothache, it's a gum ache. And I got people shaking that you guys and gals know. Filling a silver diamine fluoride arrested interproximal lesion with glass animal is smart, stops food impaction from happening. I mean, this happened to me personally in, in one of the uh, uh, most remote areas of Oregon, in the Oregon frontier. It's not even designated rural, it's de designated frontier. That's where you're going today. It's designated frontier. There's less than a quarter person per square mile where, where you're going. So, I, you know, I was getting these phone calls. I was applying silver diamine fluoride according to, to the, the Duff, what I call the Duffin protocol. Okay, so I was applying it three times, applying fluoride, uh, silver diamond fluoride and then fluoride varnish, and it was turning the decay black. And I was arresting it. It was great. And then I was getting these calls from these moms. Hey, Doctor John, that black stuff. You know, uh, it didn't work. He's got a toothache. You know, and the kid had come in, and it, and it was an interproximal, and I'd look in there, and I could see that there was food impacted, and I'd take an explorer, and I'd pull out, you know, the side of a cow, and a fish, <laughs> fish and a, a fin, and a, you know, all, all the junk, Tootsie Rolls and Doritos come flying out, and what does the kid do immediately? <gasps> oh, that feels better. 
oh, you don't have a toothache anymore? No, and it's bleeding like hell, and you're going, well, you know. So I, I, have, I, I had to stop doing the silver dye before I varnish only, and that, again, uh, uh, necessity is the mother of invention, so I bet it's fun. So um, we have smart options, not just with smart alone, we have options. Uh, we can do nothing more than apply silver diamine fluoride, then we can apply glass ironware for the second or third fluoride application, or we can apply silver diamine fluoride once and then seal it with get. So again, that was number four in that, the other slide, as, as you mentioned. So SMART can provide a higher standard of care. SMART is non-traumatizing, <coughs> antibacterial, prevents infection, uh, can quickly reduce the backlog of patients with active caries and pain, adult special needs patients with rampant tooth decay, especially difficult to treat root caries can be treated painlessly. Patients who repeatedly miss scheduled appointments benefit greatly from SMART, and SMART arrests root caries in adults, and they can walk out white, and I'll show you how, okay? SMART means less emergency phone calls. So Advantage has hired me to observe. So I, I've met many of you by going into your offices and observing what you were doing. So. One of the things you may not have noticed is that I went to every one of your front desk people and I said, in all of the clinics that I've visited, what's your biggest problem? What's the daily thing? What's the thing that bugs you the most at this front desk? And the answer invariably was emergency phone calls, emergency visits, emergency after emergency after emergency. And then I went and observed the doctors and what were the doctors doing? Quadrant chemistry, what you learned in dental school. So you're treating one quadrant and leaving three quadrants untreated. Of course, yeah, I mean, you're just letting tomorrow's <coughs> emergency visit walk out the door and you're spoiling tomorrow's day by, by having, and, and there's many of the, in the advantage clinics that have as many as 10 emergencies a day. And I watched these doctors work and I said, boy, this, this, isn't, this, this won't work for me, man. I don't want to have 10 emergencies a day. That's, that's horrible. That's a terrible day. You know? uh, so we need to stop it because we're not controlling the disease. So um, SMART means less emergency phone calls. SMART is uh, less disruption in your day. You control the disease. The disease isn't in control of you. You're controlling the disease. Uh, the disease won't, the decay won't advance while waiting to provide further restorative treatment. So buys you time. SMART can be used to boost productivity. Delegation of SMART application to non-dentist providers like RDHs. Drew Mesa sitting in the front here is my dental hygienist, RDH, in, uh, at, in Bend and in Redmond at the Bluefish office. This is a pediatric dental office that is also an orthodontic office. Dr. Kate and I are super busy. We're running around like crazy. We see sometimes on a recall days as many as 50 patients a day. And they come in with the cake. And nobody, when I'm on, nobody leaves if they've got the cake without at least an application of silver diamine fluoride. And ideally, silver diamine fluoride and glass ionomer right, right then and there on a recall exam. What does she do? She walks in and says, What do you see, Dr. John? Oh, we got to do some smarts here. Jamie said, She goes, Dr. John, you're needed at chair number three and chair number seven. I'll do those. She comes in and does it. All right? Then when I'm done in chair number three and number five, she said, Dr. John, will you check those? I come in, I look at them, and it's done. Now, in that office, Dr. K owns that office. She chooses to call that ITR. No matter how many times I say smart, I don't care whether she calls it a pink elephant. Just do it. <laughs> okay? And, 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 and so whatever you want to call it, however you want to bill it, however, just make sure whatever you're doing billing-wise so you can justify it. So you can justify ITR, call it an ITR, put it down in the chart as ITR, that's fine. When, when, when we're together, I say smart, she says ITR, we're saying the same thing. We know that, okay? So patients benefit from smart who are facing many restorative uh, appointments. Does it make sense to treat a single lesion or a single quadrant of lesions while leaving other active lesions untreated, especially when you can arrest all lesions immediately using smart? I will go further by saying, is it ethical to do so? Now, I don't think we're there yet, but I think we're going there, okay? So the biggest challenge for everyone who treats Medicaid eligible patients is that many Medicaid patients do not keep their appointments. 
that is less of a problem if you control their disease with SMART, even when future appointments aren't kept, because of what Jeremy just, Dr. Horst just told us about the effect of the silver, and I'm going to add the effect of the glass eye armor also. <coughs> so with SMART, children aren't traumatized, so it's more likely that they will return for SMART applications versus for shots and drugs. Yeah? No, because it, and you'll see, because it escapes at the margins. So they walk out white if I use a pure glass ionomer. They don't walk out white if, if we use a light pure glass, but, and we'll talk about that. No, I mean, as opposed to using nothing, as opposed to bringing the doctor sort of diamide three times in three weeks, would they get a better effect at stopping decay? Because they got to have that many treatments? I'm not finding that as a, 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 in my clinical observations. Yeah. Is it already You could call it that, or you could call it an interim therapeutic restoration, ITR, or you could call it a sed fill, uh, or if you felt confident in doing it, you could call it a composite. And that's how I would charge it. But if I didn't doing it, then it depends upon it depends upon the state that you're in. Let's talk about Oregon. In Oregon, it's the law would be that if the hygienist is doing it, we gotta either bill it as an ITR or a sed fill, right? Okay, so we got to build it as an IT or a set fill. Or, or you could call it a sealant. You could call it a sealant. Yeah. And then you wouldn't have to have aerosolidity. Correct. Yep. You could do that, but I would I would advise you to charge the most that you can get in the, in the system to and and then also I would also advise you to make sure that you record what you're doing so that you record the use the use of that uh, 1354 code because that goes into a national data bank that shows that we're, we're using it. And that will help in other states that don't have coverage for that particular code. Okay. Excuse me? Do I prefer charging as an? Well, yeah, just as far as coding and recording. If my hygienist is doing it, she's got to record it as an ITR or a set fill. If I'm doing it, I charge it as a composite. I would charge it as a composite. Why? Because I'm confident that it's going to stay in and not come out. Now, if you charge it as a composite and you have to go back in and redo it, you can't recharge for another composite. But if you do an ITR or a set fill, you can do that multiple times in the state of Oregon. So until you have the confidence that it's going to stay in, I would charge it as an ITR or a set fill. Then once you've built up your confidence level for, for your technique and the way in which you're doing this, then charge for composite <laughs> per surface. And by definition, it is a composite. It's a composition of materials that we're putting in the tube. Does that answer? Cool. All right, the biggest challenge, okay, we finished that. Uh, patients benefit from SMART who are on your waiting list. Patients benefit from having the disease treated immediately. Damage to structure can be restored more conventionally at a later date. That's a very important point. You're not, you're not spoiling your chances of doing conventional dentistry later if you want to. So, patient benefits from SMART who are waiting for an OR appointment, long waits at the hospital OR are common, thus many patients don't receive any treatment and then teeth become so infected that they can no longer be safe even in the hospital. Okay, so that's happening all over all of the states. It happens a lot in Maine. And I'm stopping that. Boy, I, I've gone crazy in Maine. We're, we're, we're having, the American, the, the Academy of General Dentistry of Maine has invited me to speak in October, and we're bringing all all of the politicians that we can into into the milieu. We're inviting them to come for free. The AGD is going to pay for, for their seat in the in the audience, and and we're going to impress this upon them that the children are, are having teeth extracted that could be saved if they were treated with with Smart first, and then schedule them for the hospital if indeed that's what they need. But don't let them go and just watch these things and wait for the hospital to be able to get them in because the waiting list is so long. So Medicaid, commercially uh, insurance companies and taxpayers save a lot of money when SMART can make an OR visit unnecessary. And if that doesn't fit into what the governor said this morning, nothing does. That was really inspirational. I hope you were all as inspired as, as some of the others of us were by what uh, 
uh, mm -hmm. what John Kitzhaber had, had to say this morning. And, and I think this fits perfectly into, into his plan, okay? So SMART reduces the need for conscious sedation or general anesthesia, which can be threatening, uh, life-threatening, especially for young children. And SMART benefits fearful patients, no needles, no drills. With SMART, fear is immediately reduced. Fearful patients will eventually become more willing to accept necessary traditional treatment later. Fearful patients that you treat with SMART will recommend SMART to other fearful patients. Happens all the time in the offices that I work in. Oh my gosh, Dr. John, I'm, my neighbors were telling me that their kids were treated this way, and that's how I want my kids treated. So uh, SMART benefits special needs patients. Special needs patients uh, can be treated uh, outside of the dental office, in their wheelchair. And we have videos on this. Advantage has a, a video on me treating a patient in a wheelchair in the nursing home with her whole family present, everybody working together. Uh, many special needs patients suffer from dental neglect while they wait for a hospital appointment. These patients will benefit from immediate treatment with SMART to arrest their caries. SMART benefits patients with limited income and without insurance. SMART is an inexpensive alternative to the rest of the decay process until a patient can afford traditional tooth restorations. Yeah. Right. Have there been cases where you put it in the dialogue on and it didn't get, it didn't, wasn't, it didn't help, and so the tooth then got more decay? Have the parents said, hey, if you were still this early, it wouldn't have blown up? That has never happened to me, knock on wood. And I think it's because I really saturate what I call the decay sponge. I, I like to call it a sponge. Okay, and I like to dry the sponge. I want to get uh, the sponge as dry as possible. Then resaturate the sponge with silver diamine fluoride. How does it, it get to the base of the lesion? It percolates through capillary action to the floor. So I really saturate it. And then, uh, you know, scrub, I, I like to activate the surface and, and scrub it so it starts that capillary action working. Try to keep that going for a minute, if I can, if some kids you can, and then put my glass animal right on top of that. Okay, and remember, you're supposed to put glass animal. Glass animal is the opposite of composite. You wanna put it on a moist surface, okay? So you've got your moist surface because it's 62% water, okay? And then you're putting it on directly, but what you mentioned has never happened, and I've never had a patient say that. Never had a parent say that, what you just said, okay? So, um, Good option, two applications of silver diamine fluoride within three to four weeks and a third appointment for silver diamine fluoride plus glass armor if you're comfortable with that. He and I don't like that. He and I prefer smart in one, okay? So there's your, there's your tray. It doesn't need to be any more complicated than that. You know, I mean, you, you got your gun, you got your, your glass armor uh, capsule, uh, your advantage rest. This is polyacrylic acid over here. Uh, where's the point of thing? Uh, then your, your, I like a dappin dish with like four wells in it. Uh, that's profi paste, a, a dry angle, it helps. I like the Garmer. I don't know if you know those things, those cotton roll holders that, that are forked like this. I, I don't know, if, you know, a lot, a lot, the older individuals in the room are shaking their heads. The younger people are going, what the heck's a Garmer? So uh, they're, they're really good for isolating lower arches. I love them, but do what you need to do to isolate, to dry, because as Dr. Horst mentioned, dry, 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 and then dry some more. Make sure it's dry. Um, mirror and explore. I like a scaler or, or, or some object so I can um, remove any flash that I have. Of, uh, and, and I'll go through the technique in a minute, okay? So this is Leroy. He's age four. He was a real handful. Leroy was three years old and just bouncing off the walls and crying and yelling and screaming and biting and kicking. And uh, we did this, we arrested and restored in one appointment. And on Leroy, I used Fuji 2, which is a resin modified glass ionomer because I wanted to set it up with light. Now, Jamesa and Dr. Kate like Fuji 2. I like to use Forte because it releases almost twice as much fluoride, but it's self-setting. You gotta wait two and a half minutes for it to set. and You gotta control the moisture during that time. Jamesa doesn't like that because she's afraid that she may lose the good behavior of a patient and she likes to do it quickly. The bottom line is her results, her outcomes are as good as my outcomes, okay? She does as good a job and they come out as pretty. They're not white, they're dark. They're not as dark as an amalgam, but they come out as pretty as anything I could ever do. So I will hold hers up against mine any day of the week, okay? 
And Dr. Kate does the same. She really like Fujitsu. So I don't want to lose the baby with bathwater. I don't want to say to people, you got to use pure glass ionomer when they feel more comfortable using resin modified glass ionomer. But I will say this, make sure that you use a resin modified glass ionomer that has no more than 20% resin in it because there is nothing medicinal about resin. So you want to have at least 80% glass ionomer and Fuji 2 fits that, okay? So uh, this one, th there, there's one that I did with Fuji 2. Then Leroy got to be a better patient because he started trusting me more. Now that's what I'm calling leaving white. But notice the black border around it. Can you see that? That's the silver. And I tell the patient and the parent, when the patient can understand, Leroy couldn't, he was three years old, but his mom understood, the black is good. And I have them come right to my side and look at it. And I say, this is a good thing because it shows us that the silver is there working. And they tell them about the zombies and what kid doesn't want zombies in this month, right? Everybody <laughs> wants zombies. So I tell them about the zombies, I tell them the silver is good, you can see it, but also, very importantly, if you go to another dentist and that dentist says, what the heck did that dentist do? He left decay in there. You, mom, need to say, no, he didn't. That's the rest of decay, that's silver up and eventually we'll have everybody trained across the nation, in fact, hopefully worldwide. When they see this, they understand this is not decay that has been left. This is a rest of decay under uh, glass iron. So where do the microbes go when you drill? On the walls, in your hair, in your eyes, into dentinotubules tubules act after excavation. These are dentinotubules. tubules with bacteria in the tubules. After you've drilled, everything's white. We like to do everything white. And those bugs are in those, and now you're gonna, you're gonna, you, you, you've acid etched. So you bored holes, okay? Where the bugs go? They go into the holes that you bored. And what are they doing? They're doing this. <laughs> They're gonna get you later. They're going to get you, and then you wonder why you have recurrent decay under, under your composites? Come on. Okay. So, interesting that this does not happen with glass ionomer. But first, let's address, must all infected, affected dentin be removed? This is a paper. Pediatric Dentistry, Dental Journal in uh, 2013, the removal of infected dentin isn't fundamental for caries arrest. Here we are with another paper, the Van Thompson paper. There is substantial evidence that removing all vestiges of infected dentin from lesions of frozen pulp is not required for caries. Cochrane Report, uh, this was uh, 2012. There's a clinical advantage to leaving caries partially unexcavated. We have lots of studies that show the advantage to leaving it and not removing it. Okay. Drilling and filling does not manage the disease. Caries relapse following operating room gold standard dentistry was between 22% and 79%. 2015 study. Even when we put kids to sleep with no distractions, when we drill and fill, we get recurrent decay as often as almost 80% of the time. Jeremy. Uh, that's a wide range, 22 to 79. It is. What does that number mean? Well, I, what do both numbers mean? I, I'm not sure. All I know is that even when we put kids to sleep, even when we're working on basically a tip of them, we can get as much as that much failure. So we can get as much as 79, right? So eight out of 10. Right. But we can also get as little as two out of 10. Correct. Which is not so bad. Which is not so bad. So yeah. let's take the difference. Right. Okay, let's 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 go down the middle, which ain't so good. Right. Okay? That's that's the point. So pediatric dental utilization rates. Now combine that with this, Jeremy. Okay that only 50% of all children with already paid for benefits via Medicaid or private insurance utilize the benefits they already have, okay? So reasons cited for such, pure, such pure, poor utilization is too expensive, too invasive. Parents had a bad dental experience when they were a kid. I mean, 
drilling out all decay is unnecessary, plus it scares patients away. You know, I, I've almost all but eliminated doing pulpotomies. I'm not going to say it all together because there's those situations where I have, and, and Jeremy was with me one day when I said, I don't do them anymore, and then I did one right in front of him. <laughs> okay? Because I had to. But I don't go there anymore. I try not to go there anymore. I don't remove the, the decay. I do remove decay. Now, there's many people who do smart who don't remove decay. If I have a compliant enough patient, I try to remove as much soft material as I can without getting close. I'm very skilled at it. I do it with a spoon excavator. I don't dig deep. I'm taking out first the Tootsie Rolls and the Doritos, and then I get the, the, that, that real soft layer, and then I stop. And I try to clean the perimeter, but I don't go into the middle part. Because I don't want to do a, a I don't want again. to do pulp therapy. You say that again, John, I think that's super important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so all right. I'm cleaning, and, and you'll see pictures of this, okay? We'll say it again and again. So. I'm going in and scooping with a small spoon excavator. If it's a very large lesion, I'll scoop with a large spoon excavator. Let's get the debris and the stuff out of there. We want as much protein out of there as possible before putting the silver diamond blade in, okay? So, scraping around the perimeter is where you're gonna get your seal. That's where you're gonna get your best seal, but that's ideal. You're not going to be able to do that with everyone. The kid's bouncing off the wall. Leroy, there's no way Leroy at age three was going to let me scrape around that perimeter. I do smart anyway because I know I can always go back in Leroy and apply more silver diamine fluoride and more glass ionomer. And I can do that umpteen times until I get Leroy in the palm of my hand. And then Leroy's going to be fine with me scraping. Okay, so. Um, yeah. So even when you suspect that there's a carious exposure, but it's mm -hmm. asymptomatic, mm -hmm. no fistula, no yeah. swelling, yeah. that you do this smart and feel confident that the, that the silver great question. goes into the pole. So I want to make sure everybody heard that question because it's great, Kurt. Thank you. So even when it might be a carious exposure, okay, I have to have clear evidence of a carious exposure. First of all, uh, certainly if there's any necrosis, if, if there's an abscess, there's there's you know evidence of an abscess, a periapical abscess, always take an x-ray to check the, to check the periapical reason. Okay, asymptomatic too. And the x-ray looks like it's right in the pulp. You're gonna see this, I'm gonna show you cases. I stick my neck out and do it. Why? Because I would do it on my own kid. I would do it on my own self because the x-ray lies, because it's a two-dimensional representation of a three-dimensional system. You know, if you could take it three-dimensionally, or you could do a CAT scan of the thing, and you, and you came around, it, you might say, oh, that's just superimposition of, of carries on the buckle onto the pole. And it, you've seen it so many times. You look at the thing, how can this not be asymptomatic? It's right in the pulp. Well, it's not in the pulp. It's, it's on the buckle, and it's through a couple millimeters, but not to the pulp. You know, not yet to the pulp. So you never know how close it is or isn't, and as long as it's asymptomatic, I feel you can do no harm. And I'll tell you something else. When they do blow up, and they will, I don't attribute that to a failure of my smart. I attribute that to the fact that the bacteria had already invaded the pulp before I got there. I didn't get there early enough. That's all. Not a failure of the smart. No, essentially, if it blows up right after, you essentially put on the top of the pressure cooker. And I've never had that happen. Never? Never had that happen that it immediately did. I have had it happen that three months later, six months later, eventually, yes. But I've had that happen with conventional stainless steel crowns, too. I've had it happen with all crowns, also. Right? So, oh, well over 90% of the time, primary teeth treated with SMART last without further treatment until exfoliation. 
There's another example of a smart, and you can see the dark. Now, I like to show the parents and the children that can, that, that are able to comprehend what I'm saying. I like to show them that darkness. This is immediately post-op. And I like to tell them the darkness is going to increase. You're going to see more darkness. You're going to see dark around the border. And that's a good thing. Because it tells us the silver is down. I want mom to know what I'm doing. I want dad to know what I'm doing. I want the kid to know what I'm doing. I think that helps the treatment overall. All right? When we know what's going on. So here's a good example of, of a couple of post-op by, by a couple of weeks or a couple of months. Okay, you can see the dark border, all right, on these. That's a pure glass anomer? That That's a pure glass anomer. The one on the left is actually the Reva, and the one on the right is Forte. You can see the difference in color. The Reva's got, got a more stark white. Uh, it's almost like paper white. Uh, I prefer the Forte because it's stronger. The reason Forte is, is a favorite of mine, is that it's Fuji 9, which you've all used, the Fast Set Fuji Extra, okay? It's Fast Set Fuji Extra with added strontium and added aluminum for strengthening. So it can handle load-bearing surfaces better and marginal ridges. So when I especially have class twos, I prefer Forte over any, anything else, only because of its strength, okay? So we use, Glass ionomer for smart, but why do clinicians generally prefer resin over glass ionomer? Because they want to use resin technique, not glass ionomer technique. Why? Because it's easy to do resin technique. You desiccate a tooth, you make it dry. Dry is dry. Either it's dry or it's not dry. With glass ionomer technique, control the moisture. What does that mean? Well, that means not too wet, not too dry. Well, what does that mean, doctor? <clears throat> You're going to need to learn that when you use glass ionomer. It can't be too wet. It can't be too dry. You have to control the moisture. You want it moist. Clinicians expect the handling properties of glass ionomer to feel the same as the handling properties of resins, and they just don't. Now, I can show you how to make them work a little bit more like resin. There's ways to do that. And I'm not adding resin to them. I'm actually adding water to them. The more I put water on my finger when I press it in, the more it ends up looking glassy like a composite. And I'll show you that in a minute. Clinicians buy into the myth that glass ionomer isn't acceptable for aesthetics when it is, especially if you don't use silver under it. It can be very aesthetic, especially forte. Okay? They buy into the myth that glass ionomer won't hold up in the mouth and will dissolve or won't withstand occlusal forces. That's false does not dissolve in the mouth. We'll talk about that in a minute. And, they, and it will withstand occlusal forces if you use the proper materials. Reasons we use glass ionomer for smart instead of resin. Glass ionomer provides a permanent chemical bond at the tooth surface, not a micro-mechanical bond. We are not getting resin tags. We are not etching and having resin tags going into tubules. That isn't happening. There's actually a, a, a molecular cross-linking at the tooth surface, at the tooth glass ionomer inter interface. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. Okay? Glass ionomer creates an internal remineralization and chemically fused zone at the layer of the tooth, at the, at the interface of the tooth and the glass ionomer. Glass ionomer releases fluoride and it recharges with fluoride the more with more fluoride from fluoridated toothpaste. So it releases fluoride, takes in fluoride, releases fluoride, takes in fluoride, releases fluoride. So it's a reservoir. It's constantly getting recharged, releasing, recharging and releasing. Okay. It's ideal to use in hydrophilic environments. Glass ionomer should be applied under moist tooth surfaces. I just mentioned that. Glass ionomer is compatible with two structures, because biocompatible because the thermal expansion of glass ionomer is equal to that of dentin. Okay, glass ionomer, it has the same minerals in it that a tooth has. There is no more tooth-like substance on planet Earth than glass ionomer. Because it's made, what's glass made from? Made from sand. Where does sand come from? The ocean. Where did you come from? The ocean. What is the repository? What is the reservoir of all minerals on this earth? It's the ocean. 
Do you know that the ocean has exactly one part per million fluoride in it? All oceans do. Isn't that interesting? Teeth, silver diamine, fluoride, and glass armor happen to be all water-based. Do you know teeth sweat? Anybody know that? Teeth sweat. Brian Novi has this great side of this, of this tooth in the mouth, this in vivo, and, and it's dripping a drop of water. And you, you, you stimulate the parathyroid hormone, you get parathyroid releasing hormone. Is, there's a study on this. Anyway, if teeth sweat, that means that they have hydrostatic pressure. That means that they have plumbing in the tooth. Okay? If they have plumbing in the tooth, they have hydrostatic pressure. Anything that has plumbing in it is like a river or like a stream. It's got hydrostatic pressure. I'm a whitewater kayaker. I know hydraulics. If you put resin tags into a tooth, it's only a matter of time before the water is going to push them out. And then those bugs in there that went like this, when you put that composite in, are going to have space to start wiggling around and saying, we're going to get that guy. And then you have recurrent decay. That makes me ask a question. I just thought Remember what I'm saying on the top. It provides a permanent chemical bond to the terse tooth surface, not a micromechanical lock. And I'm going to show you a photomicrograph of that that's just awesome, can come from Ken No. Uh, amazing what happens at the very surface. You get this layer that is totally acid resistant. So it begs the whole metric that we have in dentistry. And we're going to talk about that. Does it matter whether the stuff sticks? Even when a glass armor is lost, guess what? That zone, that tooth surface chemical bond permanent, is still there even when the glass armor is lost. What's the outcome? No decay. <clears throat> yeah, go ahead. Um, how about the toxicity of glass armor? What's your experience? Um, I think glass armor is more toxic, but I'm not sure. More caustic? Uh, well, let's put it this way. Get more pulpal death under deep glass armors, where I don't excavate. I haven't been putting uh, silver. Uh, silver diamond quite underneath uh, glass armor. <coughs> it makes it look bad, but under amalgam, sometimes I will. Yeah. But not always. Yeah. And, so, you know, so then everyone says, oh, you should No, well, I don't like calcium hydroxide at all. You're just building a house on sand. Well, it doesn't stick to anything. Yeah. But uh, I, I, I like silver diamine fluoride because I'm not creating the house on sand. I'm doing the opposite. I'm, I'm strengthening tooth materials. Yeah, of course, if people want nice white shiny teeth and they end up black shiny teeth. Absolutely. So, so you have to show them their smile line and say this doesn't show. Now, if it's in the smile line, then we got a whole other issue, right? Yeah. But again, I'm a pediatric dentist, and I've done, I'm starting to treat a lot more adults and I'm finding that glass ionomer is incredibly sedative. Now, what kind of glass ionomer are you using? Uh, Fuji Equion two surfaces and Fuji two light shared on like buckle class one. Mm -hmm. Cool. We're using the same stuff I'm using. I, I'm I'm not finding what you're finding. I'm I'm uh, but but I'm using silver dynamic fluoride. So yeah, yeah. Okay. And there's ways to mask the blackness. Well, I always figured you could uh, grind off the surface layer and put like chrome. No, no, you don't want any resin in there. Well, yeah, but I, mean, I got a better idea. I've got a better idea. So why don't you go ahead and put it on, uh, put put a layer in there, um, and then mask the, and, and light cure it. Use Fuji two on the bottom, light cure it, and then use uh, a beauty fill, Shofu beauty fill, which is an opaque. It's a resin modified glass opaque by Shofu. And you just put that in there, and it's nice and hard, and you can put that in there. That's going to mask it, and then put glass animer on top, all the way to the top. And I don't like resin over it. I'm sorry. I mean, I did, the, I did the, the, the sandwich technique for years, and I don't like the sandwich technique. Because what does it do? It blocks the glass ionomer from its release of fluoride into the mouth. And then people say, yeah, but, but it wears faster. Well, it's not really wearing faster. It's dissolving. 
as it releases the fluoride, it has to dissolve. So it starts to get lower and lower off of the occlusal, but I look at that occlusal layer right there as sacrificial. So you get the patient in once every year or once every two years, and guess what? Just apply more glass armor on top of it, on that sacrificial layer. And you're gonna have less decay. That patient is gonna have less decay the more glass armor and silver diamond fluoride you put in their mouth, <clears throat> in general, because of what Jeremy told us. Another question? Somebody had their hand up? No? Okay, let's go on then. Um, so, longevity of glass ion. Okay, so resin composite has a lifespan of six years. Glass ionomer had a lifespan of 11 years. Journal of Dentistry, 2009. Electron probe microanalysis demonstrated that fluorine and strontium ions from glass ionomer penetrated deep into underlying demineralized dentin. This pattern is consistent with remineralization, the only source of these ions was the glass animal restoration, Journal of Dentistry, 2005, and I'm gonna go back to that very statement only from Dr. Jeremy Horst from just a few months ago, and that'll be one of the slides you're gonna see, because this was corroborated by him. Kerastatic properties, glass animal restoratives have less re recurrent decay than amalgam after six years in permanent teeth, European Journal of Pediatric Dentistry, 2009. Glass animal provides caries protection effects and cable surface at, at, at uh, adjacent surfaces, the Journal uh, of the California Dental Association, 2003. And then the American Journal of Dentistry, 2004, Glass ionomer becomes enamel-like after two years, and I'm gonna show you some photos of that that I think you're gonna be really impressed with. Glass ionomer, does it dissolve out? No, it does not dissolve in surface wears as it continually releases fluoride. Regardless, the tooth gick interface remains molecularly linked and acid-resistant. Now, the, the reference to that is Atlas of Glass Ionomer, a clinician's guide by Mount and No, NGO, 2002. It's actually, there's a new edition out. Uh, resins degrade with time and they leak with no chemistry to fight acid challenges and with no acid resistant molecular link to tooth structures. They're pretty and don't take them out of your toolkit because if I snap off my central incisor in half on my surfboard, I want you to put a composite on there, Aaron, please, so don't take it out of your toolkit. This might be the most important slide you're gonna to see today from me, okay. This is from him, no. This is enamel on the left, dentin on the right, there's your glass ionomer. This in the middle is what Dr. Doug Young calls the Rocky Mountains, and that's that chemically fused zone. That's that layer, that acid-resistant, molecularly linked layer that is more important than the remaining glass ionomer once it forms. It takes as long as eight weeks to form. It doesn't happen overnight. So you want your glass ionomer on there for eight weeks, but let, let's say we start losing it, or it dissolves off, or they don't come back, or whatever. As long as, it, as this has started to form, it's acid resistant. So, John, can you go back to that just for one second? Sure. So I just want to explain that that uh, they took a tooth that had enamel and glass ionomer, right. and they etched it. They put acid all over the top right. to demineralize it. And then what was left is this super resistant layer. Exactly. So it was, you know, they bathed it in acid overnight, and still this layer influenced by the filling was more resistant than normal enamel. You know, for the layer. That's the point. That's so, resin retention depends upon micromechanical interlocking of resin tags inside the dental tubules and enamel prism. I did it for 40 years. I, my, my resins were held up as, as a standard in New England. I studied first under, under uh, Ron Jordan, then under Ray Berlotti, John Kenka, Gordon Christensen. I studied under the best, and my composites were like, you know what, I was never a taker downer, I was always a filter upper. I never took a finishing bird to them. They ended up like glass, why? Because I'm a glasser, that's what I do in the surfboard industry. I make surfboards, and when I'm done, 
with my resin coat, you can see your reflection in it. So it goes onto the, onto the floor to be sold as a surfboard. And I know full well. You don't mess with that. Your hot coat's your hot coat, man. That's the glasser's code of honor. That's how I do resins. Don't take anything to them, man. You're gonna craze them, those resins. You're gonna turn them into, you know, you're gonna get that, that crazing that you get like in a porcelain cup. You don't touch that, man. You build it up, you learn anatomy, you learn to be a builder-upper. I haven't met very many builder-uppers in my career. So I was an advocate, I was evangelistic about, about composites until I learned what glass ionomers do. And then I realized, oh my God, all that pretty stuff in the back? We don't need that, we need prevention. What do I want in my mouth? What have I put in my own mouth? Yeah, I, I should tell that to you. Tell it. Okay, so, <laughs> so three years ago, um, we were watching a movie, 10 o'clock at night, uh, eating a bowl of popcorn, and uh, I bit into an old maid, an unpopped uh, kernel, and uh, on number four, I had an occlusal amalgam that my father had done probably when I was 12 years old. My dad was a dentist when I was probably 12 years old, and I broke the cusp right off of it. So I went down into the van where I had my kit, the same kit I bring when I go to a van, and I had some hand-mixed Fuji 9, the same stuff, you know, the Fuji Extra uh, Fuji 9. And I hand-mixed it uh, at the kitchen sink, so I had some polyacrylic acid. First thing I did was I brushed my, my teeth real well, flossed real well, used my electric toothbrush, brushed it real well, rinsed, uh, and, you know, dried it as best I could with a washcloth, I didn't have anything else. And then I applied my, uh, my uh, polyacrylic acid, and I started mixing the, the uh, the glass animal, hand mixing the glass animal. My wife came in, what are you doing? <laughs> and I said, hey, I don't And she goes, well, just don't get any of that on the countertop. <laughs> you know? Okay, so she was worried about the countertop, I'm worried about my tooth. So I ended up putting it on my fingernail and, and just doing this. And then I happen to have a gold fogel instrument because I always carry at least one with me, which is just a, a plastic instrument shaped like a spade. And, and, I, I, and I, I dipped it in water and at first I dipped my finger in the water and I got it real nice and glassy because water will do that in glass animals. And I took the, the spade and I just, I made sure I had it all, you know, I'm looking in the mirror with my glasses and everything. And then I said, oh boy, all right, I better just go to bed on this. So, you know, out go the lights and went to sleep. I woke up the next morning and called Doug Young, University of Pacific. Uh, Doug Young is probably the foremost expert in glass animal chemistry and glass animal placement in our country. And I said, Doug, guess what I did? He goes, oh my gosh, John, I can't believe it. Oh, uh, uh, whatever you do, because we, we've had breakfast together, don't eat that bowl of granola this morning. He said, I want you to favor that for at least 48 hours. Just have your, your, your yogurt, have a banana, and just be, you know, and eat on the other side all day for the next two days and call him. So I called him two days later. I said, Doug, it's, it's great. It's all good. He says, I think, you're, I think you're out of the woods. Go ahead, go back to normal living. So I did, and I never saw my dentist uh, for a year. And then I went in to see my dentist, it was just a normal exam, he goes, oh, what's that? And I told him, he goes, oh, well, uh, let's get that out of there and put a composite on. And I said, well, you know, it does show in my smile line, but I, I'm fine with the aesthetics of it. And uh, he goes, well, uh, let me just pop that out. I said, go ahead, give it a go. <laughs> and he, ta he takes his sharpest, burliest scaler and he starts reefing on it. Don't do a damn thing. He goes, so you, oh, okay, John. Look, it's it's a little bit rough because it's a glass animal and you want that nice and smooth. So I'll etch that and put on a composite. I said, no, you won't. No, you won't. And that's still there. Jeremy asked to see it last night, and it just feels great. It's a little bit rougher than the enamel, but and it's been on there now for three years. And I am rugged on my teeth. I'm, I'm, I'm just, I, I, you know, I have to wear a night guard. I'm just, I'm awful, you know. And I eat things I shouldn't be eating. You know, I eat a really, really coarse diet. I'm very Neanderthalic. <laughs> did I put fluoride on? I did not. No, there wasn't any decay. This was just a pure fracture. Just a clean break. Correct. No, no, uh, no decay. It wasn't related to that at all. Yeah, just related to older age and eating and eating popcorn, you know, something you want to watch out for. So anyway, yeah, um, and, and, and I know that it's molecular, molecularly bound, but most importantly, even if I were to lose the surface of it, what's happening at that interface here, 
That's what's important to me on tooth number four in my mouth, okay? And then I went to another dentist at our office and I had a crown fall on, right? I'm out, I'm out backcountry skiing and, and you know, I, and I, I was eating a, a power bar. You know, those things are sticky, they're like Turkish taffy. I just, and out comes my three quarter crown. Oh crap, you know, I'm like, here I am, don't drop it in the snow, John. You know, there was powdered snow up to the waist. You know, you're never gonna find it. What am I gonna do? And I cut through and off out there. I went in, I said, okay, no more power bars, I'm gonna be fine. That night, I'm eating, came out, a little bite of steak. I said, boy, I'm gonna have to do something. So I went to the dentist at our office, one of the dentists, not Dr. Cape, but one of the other dentists that worked in our office. And he says, oh, that's a beautiful three-quarter crown. Look at that thing, isn't that gorgeous? And he says, oh, great. He says, the dental assistant, go ahead, get, get this amount out. And she's, what'd she get? She got Reliax. She's getting Reliax off. This guy's ready to put everything I fought in. He's getting ready to put this thing on my tooth. I said, what the hell are you doing? He said, what do you mean? I said, stop. Just stop. I looked at the dental assistant, and I said, you know what to do. And she said, yes, Dr. John, but I didn't. I just do it. <laughs> she gets the silver diamine fluoride out. She goes, oh, Doctor, I think he wants the silver first. So, of course, silver diamine fluoride first. Why wouldn't you if you were putting the crown on? And then mixed up some forte. Put the forte in there, drove it home. I bit it home. There it is. And I had sens sensitivity in that tooth, and I have not had it since we did that. Yeah. And that was, what, how long ago was that? That was like, what, six months? Eight months ago, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, probably that long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Jeremy. Uh, so, um, we can use glass ionomer cement for sealants in permanent molars. There's been a long criticism of them, as John's saying, if you don't treat them right at the beginning and eventually anyway, the bulk of the glass ionomer can fall out. So there were studies looking at retention of sealants of resin versus glass ionomer. Resin does better at sticking. But if you actually look at the cavities, because we're not trying to stick stuff to teeth, we're trying to prevent cavities. If you actually look at prevention of cavities in first molars from sealants, this is the data going two years, three years, four years, five years, comparing glass ionomers being better at preventing versus resin sealants being better at preventing all of the studies that have been done. And so just real quick, this is called a forest plot. And the idea is that you see the forest from the trees. So each of these little things is a different multi, uh, sorry, a randomized clinical trial. This had 300, 860, 350, 200 patients. And they're summarized by this little diamond. And if the diamond crosses that middle line, it says that they're equivalent. And so in terms of preventing cavities using glass anomer sealants versus resin, they're the same, they're the same, they're the same. After five years, there's a trend towards glass anomer better. And so uh, we actually fought uh, the, uh, what was the entity, the Oregon Health Association? It was OHA. OHA. Just, OHA. Yeah. Uh, to allow glass ionomer to be considered a sealant uh, for your state. And uh, after a long story, uh, many people contributing, uh, we won. Yeah. So this is now allowed. Um, and the amazing thing, like John is saying, you have to be careful of moisture control but well, you can just wipe the glass on, you know, brush and then wipe the glass on or into an occlusal. Um, so this is actually the technique in these studies is using a finger or just expressing from the gun and then having Vaseline, putting it over the top and that's it. So there's no edge behind any of that stuff in these studies. Sherry. I just want to clarify to everyone that it's not currently allowed. They're in the process of going through um, the approval for the rules advisory committee. To me, the most interesting aspect of it was that when we went in, she said, do you understand what Charity said? This is about certified school programs. The state OHA was saying through the State Office of Health that only resins could be used 
as sealants, and glass animers could not. They made a ruling in the state legislature for that. So Dr. Shercliffe and Dr. Horst and Dr. Duffin and, and Dr. Milgram and I uh, said, no, that's not acceptable because many of you who are hygienists who are sitting here right now, we're saying, wait a minute, we're in settings in schools where we can't keep the teeth dry and it isn't appropriate to use a resin because we're in underwater situations and we know the glass ionomer will work and we know that the resins won't. So on behalf of the expanded function dental hygienists who are out in the schools and out in the community doing this, we went in to make a case to have the rule changed. And what was most interesting to me is that they brought their scientists in and they sided with us, <laughs> not with the state office. And the director of the state office of dental health of the state of Oregon continually said, but the retention rate of the glass ionomer is not uh, uh, acceptable. And what we're telling you is that it doesn't matter if the stuff sticks. What matters is the outcome, which is less decay. And that's what we're attempting to do with a preventive sealer program in schools. So we will persist until this gets changed uh, for the benefit of the children. So um, how does the, the, this acid resistant, and, and, and you know, Jeremy, this, this is, I think that this is the science behind it. Hold on one second, let me just get through this. Okay, the ionic transfer of mineral ions at the two surface, that's how it happens. So, calcium, phosphorus, fluoride, aluminum, strontium ions transfer in the water-based environment of the mouth from the glass to the tooth and from the tooth to the glass. Ionic transfer can't happen in the absence of water. You don't have ionic transfer with resin. It's an anhydrous environment. Ions are just negative or positive charged particles around atoms. And they can't, they can't just act through space. They have to, they, to, to exchange with each other, to interact with one another. They need to be in an aqueous solution. Yeah, go ahead. So in that slide, we would call it after five years of glass ionomers better. Would uh, that only with glass ionomers that stay for five years? No. That's the whole it's point. Like the tree. Yeah. No. No. Exactly. Thank you. The, great question. You bet. So, can this happen with resin? No, because resins require dry field. Resins are not water-based. What happens when glass ionomer is lost? The chemically fused zone remains, which protects the surface of the tooth. Even when a glass ionomer is lost, the tooth surface remains decay-free because of the magic of remineralization via ionic transfer. Now, go ahead, Jeremy. It's the most what? Correct. Glass is, not glass animal. I'm sorry, if I said glass animal, I didn't mean to. I meant glass. Glass is more tooth-like than any other man-made substance that we have on the planet. It could be what? Right. Right. Correct. Yeah. So let's let's look at it further. You know, the outcome you're looking for is a carries three tooth, not whether it's lost or retained, but rather whether or not it prevented decay in the tooth or the teeth in which it was placed. And this is an amazing slide to me. This came from Marty McIntyre. This is from the '80s, right, Steve? This is from the 80s. This is from Saudi Arabia in the 80s. Okay, so glass ionomer in the, in the top slide was placed at five years old. Then it was gone at age seven. In two years, the glass ionomer remineralized the carry and also carries and also reduced the size of the carries in the adjacent tooth. Thus, the glass ionomer prevented decay even when it was lost between age five and age seven. So you can see this calcified area, how much more calcified that is over the pulp, and it stopped that from growing. In fact, it got smaller. That's without silver diamine fluoride. 
Can everybody see that? That's without silver diamine fluoride. That's from the 80s. I don't think of glass anomer as a filling material anymore. I think of it as a medicine. And I consider silver diamine fluoride a medicine. This is the medical management of carrots. And we're using two medicines combined, combination therapy. When we get cancer, we don't give one chemotherapeutic agent. We use a combination of chemotherapeutic agents. So back to the Dr. Horse cancer analogy. Does a sealant on the occlusal prevent caries interproximally? When's the last time you saw a study with 2,557 seven years old? Holy cow, that's a huge study out of Italy. Am I right, Jeremy? I mean, you're the, you're the, that number blew my mind when I saw that. So, you know, explain the graph, please. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So they, they did x-rays uh, following after two and a half years after placing the sealant to look at the distal of the second primary molar see if there was a new lesion that wasn't there at the beginning. And with resin, on average, there was about one. And with glass anomer, there was a third less. So, so again, I was so excited about silver chloride because you're getting less new cavities on untreated surfaces, suggesting you're getting towards the heart of the disease. Same thing here. By putting the glass anomer up here instead of resin, through fluoride release, metal ion, I don't know, somehow, from the mechanism of that, we're getting less cavities here. So presumably it's the metal ion release and the fluoride release, ion release. Which is why when I do a SMART and I have more material left in my capsule, I put it on as many teeth as I can until I'm done with that capsule. Why would I just throw that away? That's good. Isn't it? I keep telling you this and I do. I go this. And then they, they panic because now they got to change the treatment plan. And, oh, gee, you did that, Dr. John, without the signing of the treatment plan, and you just did a sealant on those teeth. I don't even care if you record it. I'm not going to waste the stuff. I'm going to squeeze it in there every tooth I possibly can. <laughs> Which is what I was doing in Frontier, Oregon. I was going into the schools and just putting it on every single tooth I possibly could, just on, on, on kids from preschool all the way up to 12th grade. I'd just go in and squeeze and squeeze and squeeze and squeeze twice a year. Totally wiped out the tooth they raped in, that, in those three communities. Spray, Fossil, and Mitchell. Twice a year I went and just kept squeezing it in, squeezing it in, squeezing it in, and it became a reservoir of fluoride release that was preventing cavities even interproximally, even when they weren't brushing and flossing and eating crappy food. So, How long yes. Is it how long am I trying? Uh, must be really thank you. slow because I can't do that many teeth with one. <laughs> yeah, so, so thank you, Kurt. That, uh, how long do we trich rate? One of the biggest problems that I'm finding in your Advantage clinics, those of you that work in Advantage clinics, is that, uh, that you're not really uh, activating properly. First of all, the first <coughs> thing you do with your glass anomer capsules is you gotta tap them on the table. Bang, 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 bang. Because what you have in that capsule is a membrane in the mem middle that is separating ground glass powder on one side and polyacrylic acid on the other side. So the ground glass powder has been sitting in a box, in a capsule in a box, on its side like this, and it's all just packed in like, like, like powder bits, any kind of powder, flour, talcum powder, whatever. So you want to bang it to fluff it up, get it, get it, wake it up, you know, get, get, get it all broken up. And then the next thing you want to do is click once. And that breaks that, that membrane and lets the liquid polyacrylic acid communicate with the powdered glass, right? And then you're going to triturate that for 10 seconds, okay? And then put it in the gun and you're ready to go, okay? So 10 seconds. Okay, when you say click, what do you mean? There's a plunger, so you click it one. Well, actually, before you do any, I'm sorry, I missed a step, didn't I, Jamesa? Sorry. You, you fluff it like this, then you push the plunger down. Yes, okay. You push the plunger down, then you put it in the gun and click it once. And then take it out and triturate it. Then take it out and triturate it, and then put it back into the gun, and then click it twice and hand it to the doctor. Now, Rella Christensen, you all know Rella. 
I just love that gal. She's awesome. She's a microbiologist. She is the, the wife of, of Gordon Christensen. And uh, she's a dental hygienist also, and was a pediatric dental assistant in a pediatric office for 10 years before she became a hygienist. And she says, John, if you ever know her the way she talks, she says, John, we've got to stop this manhandling. We've got to stop this manhandling of these capsules. And boy, when you watch your dental assistant do it, aren't you, I mean, you're man, you want, I just, my heart bleeds for them. They're manhandling this thing, the bang, the click, the gun, the gun thing out of there and not all guns are created equal if you get one of the other guns that isn't a GC gun and you're trying the thing out and this that and the other that's got to stop plus the cost of it has got to stop I mean each one of these things is costing us too much money so if we're going to move forward the next thing that has to happen is we've got to be able to have each capsule uh, be less expensive or maybe eliminate the capsule altogether so uh, I've been working with GC America. Uh, my disclosures, by the way, are that I, I, I take nothing from anybody. They, 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 they help me out by providing materials for me for situations like this, so you'll have samples outside. But, uh, and all the companies do that, not, not just GC. But GC has stepped up to the plate above all the other companies and have taken my suggestion of a double barrel syringe with a mixing tip, okay? So they're actually, have formulated Fuji 2 so we can eliminate the triturator and we eliminate the capsules. So I have a test product. It, it, you know what, they gotta go through the same FDA approval that, that we had to with, with uh, SDF. So it's really kind of there in the, in the mix in the middle of that. But the concept being that we have two pace, one plunger or a gun like this that brings a plunger through the gun and then mixes it through a mixing tip which is disposable and removable so for patient to patient, and then you eliminate the the, uh, the triturator. And it's got to be self-set within two and a half minutes and light cure both. So so we can satisfy Jamaica and Dr. Kate, they want to have the light cure. To satisfy me, I'd rather really not have the light cure. I don't, I don't like it. I like to actually watch it work, and there's reasons for that, and I'll show you in a minute. But anyway, uh, we'll have new, that's why my first slide says, you know, what, what I'm teaching you today is going to change tomorrow. There's gonna be new materials, new stuff available, and the reason for this is an advantage is so exemplary, and, and this is what made GC finally step up to the plate on this. I said, we have 15, correct me if I'm wrong, 15 hygien, uh, hygienists in the schools, or in the uh, community doing smart? 13, wow, okay. So we have 13 uh, expanded function dental hygienists, so many of them are sitting right here with us today who are in the communities, in all communities, all over, all over Oregon, uh, applying, doing SMART uh, in, in uh, WIC clinics and in schools and in community centers. And, uh, and they're having to bring triturators and lights and all that. It just, it, it just doesn't work when you, when you look at the, the, the nature of that public health measure. It should be much simpler and so we need a simpler delivery. 20 minutes. Cool. Um, did I finish that? Oh, yeah. Get does more than just seal. Dr. Jeremy Horst, March of 2017. This is a quote. We were looking with a uh, scanning electron microscope, CAT scan, two millimeters from the bottom of the glass anomer and two structure and found ourselves asking, what are aluminum and strontium doing there, here, remineralizing, so close to the pulp. We realized that the healing minerals were from the glass ionomer which had popped out, so wasn't even there. We confirmed the same finding in another sample with retained glass ionomer. I always used to roll my eyes at the idea of ion exchange, but it's real. The minerals could only have gotten there via ionic transfer. Git does more than just seal. From Dr. Jeremy. Okay. All right, Jeremy, why don't you explain it? <laughs> so this, this is, is Jeremy's slide, I'd rather have him. Yeah. So this is a CAT scan of, of one of the smart treated teeth um, where there was really clean, so enamel, dentin, and we, we have to section the tooth to get it small enough to, um, to get high resolution imaging. There was good excavation on the sides, on the periphery of caries, of the carious dentin, 
Um, and there was plenty of carious dentin left at the bottom. I call this a watermelon slide because it kind of looks like a watermelon, right? So um, it's just that anything that's more dense than enamel is red. And the really, really, really dense stuff that's like is nearly as dense, well, I don't know, extremely dense, it is black. Um, and so what you see, this whole red thing is glass ionomer to about, about here. And this stuff down here is the silver chloride. Show them where the pulp is. The pulp is this hole down here. This is the pulp horn over here, pulp horn that way. That's the pulp. So what ends up happening is the glass ionomer, it's a solid, right? So it can only be pushed down so far. Then the silver fluoride is going to penetrate down really far immediately and start to solidify into these silver solids, filling the gaps left by the bacteria that are invading the tooth. But the part that I didn't realize, so this is one of the teeth actually that I was scanning looking for the elemental analysis because I wanted to prove that, that these densities are silver. I mean, what the hell else could it be? But what form of silver and blah, blah, blah. So literally this tooth, I was scanning down here with this electron microscopy that gives you the profile of elements. And I kept seeing this strontium and aluminum. I'm like, what the hell? And it was that over time, since this was in the patient's mouth for a couple of years after this was done, that the even though the glass anomer filling couldn't reach down there, yeah. the ions did reach way the heck down here to strengthen the tooth. And metal ions, one of the things I've been studying in the lab, it's not just silver that kills bacteria. All these metal ions kill bacteria. So hardens the tooth and strengthens it. Can you show the next one too? Okay. So we're gonna zero in. Just to show like the relationship of the silver fluoride stuff and the glass anomer stuff. And what I hope that you're thinking is like, what the hell is he talking about? Where's the border? Right? They're like, they're kind of, I don't know where one ends and where one where stuck where one starts. And I think that's kind of the point, is that there was a void in the remaining curious material that was filled in by the silver fluoride. The glass anomer sat down as far as it could go and the two solidified together. John's told you that Doug told me. I want to show you something, because just in case we oh, don't yeah. get to it. I, just, I should have yeah. shown that afterward. I'll, I'll show you these, but look at this. This is from yeah. a patient I treated at, at Dr. Guffin's office, and this shows just what he was showing, it, right? I mean, this is, this is exactly it. So these are exfoliated teeth, one and a half years after treatment, and that's what that scanning electron mic microscope microscopy and, and CAT scan was showing. Same thing. So you can actually see it there. Okay? That's why I consider it a medicine. Okay, so let me go back to where we were. More quickly. And, uh, okay, these are... There we go. There we are. So, uh, mineral ions and bacteria must be introduced into the decay... Uh, wait a minute, wasn't that one? Oh, yeah. So, yeah, remineralization can always return in decayed enamel and dentin. So the cycle of demineralization followed by remineralization is constant in the normal oral flora, but at all stages in the development of the caries process, even with a big caries lesion, there is, it is always possible for remineralization cycles to occur through the same pathways by ionic transfer. Okay, outcomes, generally speaking, if a resin sealant is retained, but it lifts, food gets under it, and you get decay. With glass ionomer, retention doesn't matter as much because the outcome remains the same, retention or not. Even if the glass ionomer could hinge, and I've never seen it, it doesn't hinge, because it's not flexible like a resin. It's not plastic, it's glass. So it doesn't hinge. But let's say, hypothetically, oh, it hinged, doctor. Okay, then the high fluoride content of the glass ionomer would prevent underlying substrate from causing decay. And that isn't true with resins. <coughs> uh, glass anomer, these are myths. Glass anomer is not easier to apply than composite. You have to learn how to apply glass anomers. You already know how to do composite. It, it's not a no-brainer. Uh, moisture ex exchange, uh, uh, moisture control is, is real important. How to mix, we talked about that. Uh, these are these are smart cases done in, in Fiji by uh, by Dr. Doug Young. That's before, that's after. So that, uh, excuse me, that's before, that's after uh, partial excavation. So this cleaning of the perimeter is ideal. You're not going to get it in every single patient, but ideally, when you can remove 
at that level, you're going to get a better seal. It's important to note that this is immediate post-op. These are going to turn dark, guys. These are going to turn dark. They're going to, just as soon as the, the light gets them. They're not going to be real dark. They're going to be way better than that. Okay? So it's a huge improvement. But you can see these are already starting to turn dark. You're going to see, you can see this border right here. Uh, Doug did this. I love to show this slide. Again, he did, he did a smart here. And look, oh, isn't he a sloppy dentist? What a horrible thing. He left a little blob of glass on her there. Hey, look, come on. That's going to be gone tomorrow as soon as that person is. Yeah. I don't even know if Doug know, knows that that was there. But every time I blow it up, I see that. And I go, you know, I try to get that when, I, when I'm doing it. I try to get that off of the scaler. But sometimes you can't because the kid is squirming. Okay. That was all done without needles and without drills and fusion. Okay, so bacteria kill plus remineralization equals smart. SDF remineralizes quite vigorously. SDF also kills bacteria, but not necessarily all. Glass ionomer remineralizes and uh, dentin and enamel, even when deeply demineralized. Combining silver dimine chloride and glass ionomer makes sense. So this is uh, th these huge lesions on S and T were on a seven year old, and uh, I did smarts and and uh, I didn't I didn't put glass ionomer. Uh, in, in, uh, in one and I did in the other and it looks terrible but look at the x-ray and this is one of those cases that's right on top of the pulp I mean you know look at that look at number T come on I really stuck my neck out huh well and these teeth are ready to exfoliate so this was one year post-op absolutely asymptomatic okay talked about hall technique. If you like halls, if you like stainless steel crowns, that's wonderful. It, it, no reason not to. But how about smart hall? Okay, so silver diamine fluoride, then your glass ionomer, drive it home. 90% of stainless steel crowns treated with a hall technique, uh, as Dr. Post was saying earlier this morning, uh, compared to 94% uh, done conventionally, uh, were successful. Okay, then after that article came out, I wrote a commentary to that article, and they published it as a commentary in, uh, in JETA. And I, my point was that modifying the Hall technique by applying silver diamine fluoride to decay dentin first before placing your stainless steel crowns with glass ionomer could probably, possibly result in even greater success. Can we achieve better results using non-invasive measures is this not a higher standard of care? Another smart justification, toothache is not a, uh, uh, a, a, a gum ache is not a toothache. We talked about this. This is doing a class two. I have a shim in there. Uh, I'm applying my silver diamine fluoride, glass ionomer. This is what these, these look like, you know, six months later. They've got the black border on them. With the pure glass ionomer. Hmm? With pure glass ionomer. Pure glass ionomer. This is pure glass ionomer, not resin modified. They did not shine a light on this. Okay, it left perfectly white. It came back three months, six months later with this black border. Okay, and you saw these. Thank you, Steve, for those. A resin modified glass ionomer is okay to use? Yes, but pure uh, glass ionomer is best in my opinion because it releases more fluoride. Make sure your glass, your resin glass, resin modified glass ionomers have at least 80% glass ionomer and only 20% uh, so uh, uh, resin. So. Smart heals teeth from these. Now, this is a, a remarkable case, in my opinion. Uh, this was almost four years uh, between uh, doing this. this. This kid came in uh, with a tooth that had just barely erupted into his mouth. He was six years old. It had a huge decay. It was at the end of the day. I did a smart. I applied silver diamond fluoride glass ironer. I said to the parent, whoa, we're taking a huge chance here. That's real close to the pole. I want you guys to come in in a, in a week. We'll, we'll get you in as soon as we can. They never showed they never showed, they never showed. Almost four years later, my dental assistant came up to me, oh my God, Billy Smith is coming in, who's that? She told me, she showed me the x-ray, oh boy. Kid sits in the chair, I said, hey, how's, how's that tooth? And, what tooth? I said, mom, you're supposed to come in. Oh, Dr. John, I'm sorry, you know, I, I, I was going through a divorce, I didn't tell you, we moved out of town, I'm back in town. And I go, so how's that tooth? And they both looked at me and said, is something supposed to be wrong? And I said, no, I said, I, I like to drill, the, this was Fuji 2, by the way, mm -hmm. and I like to drill the Fuji 2 out of there, and I'm not going to make you know. I'm just going to 
all I'm going to use my drill on is the glass. And this is what I found on the left side, black. Some of it, it wasn't entirely calcified. There was some mush in there. I said, oh boy. And I removed the mush, and what you see on the right was what was underneath. And you can see the flashback from my flash on my camera. That's shining back. That is the glass-like, the glass animal. Look at this tube healed That's itself. Dentin. That's a dentin. That That's a dentin. Doing. That's glass-like dentin. Glass-like dentin that, that through the permanent first molar shown in these slides healed itself via pulpal odontoblastic response to the silver diamine fluoride and glass animal applied three years previously at one point, appointment without needles of drill. The odontoblastic response of the pulp created sclerotic acid resistant super hard secondary dentin. The glass ionomer made that dentin glass like. The silver diamine fluoride killed at least some of the bacteria while also providing future bacterial protection through the zombie effect of silver. Okay, hiding anterior scars. This silver diamine fluoride was applied three times to this two year old. Very unmanageable in the chair. Etched, rinsed, bonding agent. Went back to composite technique on this. Applied beauty fill, resin modified glass and mural paper over the arrested, unexcavated carries, no shots, no drills. It chipped. I added more, no shots, no drills, two and a half years old. This gal came in at three years old. Mom was perfectly satisfied with three applications of silver diamine fluoride. She was an editor of a magazine in Millbridge, Maine, and she said, I don't care. I love that stuff. I want, I said, let me make it white, please. No. I said, I'll do it for free. Well, okay. And I did this. <laughs> and even though I did this, and the kid was thrilled about it, Mom said, I just don't care. I only care about the fact that you killed the decay. It's really kind of interesting. I find this very interesting. This is glass ironer and strip cons to mask the black scar of silver diamond fluoride. No needles, no drills. This came from uh, Thierry Boulanger in, uh, in Belgium. And he did silver diamond fluoride three applications. He did the strip crown technique uh, that Dr. Post was talking about earlier this morning. And here you have it. Uh, he didn't even mask the white. So you see the, a little bit of darkness here but way better than what we had before. And this is with strip crowns, and this is with no needles and no drills. <coughs> this is Claire. Uh, Claire had lateral incisors that were, uh, uh, that were carious, and we did the beautiful opaquer on her in Steve's uh, uh, living room and kitchen at his, uh, at his son's condo here at Eagle Crest. Uh, done painlessly in just a few minutes. Claire's mom is, has a master's in microbiology and is an orthomolecular biologist by profession. Her quote is, it just seems crazy to me that the whole practice of dentistry ignores the underlying disease. This is essentially an infectious disease that can be approached differently. Once you treat active decay with something like silver, there's much validity in changing the flora of the mouth. Silver streaks, this is the slide, uh, one of the slides that Jeremy showed. This is my slide. You can see the streaks in the tube. I, I, just, I just like the superimposition. That's internal, that's external. And that's Fuji tube. <laughs> is it ethical to eventually replace a smart restoration with a more traditional or conventional restoration on a permanent or primary tooth if the tooth is asymptomatic, aesthetically acceptable to the patient, restored to function, and if there is no radiographic evidence of caries growth or spread? I'll leave you with that question. You answer it. What restoration is permanent on any tooth? Conventional amalgams, resin restorations, and crowns are considered by some to be temporary because they must often be replaced in the patient's lifetime. So many academics and clinicians, uh, clinical specialists are beginning co to consider smart restorations and crowns to be permanent repairs on primary and permanent teeth. <laughs> this is at the Moscone Center at a mini mom that we conducted in San Francisco this March at the IADR, International Association of Dental Research. Jeremy's brainchild, his idea. Uh, that's uh, Marcus uh, Duffin on the left, who's a microbiologist. That's Kate Quas over, over my head. And that's uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Graham Craig from Australia. And we're doing smarts on the streets of San Francisco. 
Uh, no needles, no drills, no compressed air. Uh, we, we had air anywhere. Uh, and these are the attendees of, the, some of these people are the top cardiologists in the world watching us do this on the street. And uh, Graham Craig kept saying, that's amazing. That's just simply amazing. <laughs> and and he's, done, he's been doing it for four years, but he hadn't been using my techniques. John, can I just mention something? Go, go back to the other sure. slide. So the gal in the, the green mm -hmm. uh, blouse there yeah. is, yeah. is Danya. Yeah. She That's ran insane. into us from Saudi Arabia, oh. okay, saw what we were doing, asked, came to Jeremy's meeting. She's now conducting a large clinical trial in Saudi Arabia based on SMART. Is she, isn't she the yeah, one that, that's the that invited one. you to Cairo? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> that's right. Exactly. The interconnections on this worldwide are incredible. This is just sweeping. Uh, why do this on the street? To demonstrate that it is possible to provide dental care anywhere in a painless and effective way. I'm almost done. Let me rip, rip through these and I'll get your question in a minute, okay? So sedation for kids, Demerol, hydroxazine, hypochlorite, nitrous oxide and local anesthesia killed Sydney Boyle in Hawaii. When I went to Hawaii uh, in January to speak to the Hawaiian Pediatric Dental Association, there was a man with his daughter, who's a pediatric dentist. He's a pediatric dentist, probably my age. His daughter is a pediatric dentist. Her husband, so his son-in-law, pediatric dentist, and their entire staff. And I went through the entire lecture of, that I do. This is very much just a part lecture. This was a full eight hour lecture. And afterwards, this Japanese American man came up to me and he said, I was called in to save Sidney Boyle's life. That happened in my building, in another pediatric dentist's office. They came in and asked me to help resuscitate her and I could not save her life. And he started to tear up said, that's why my entire staff is here today. And he said, and I'd like to invite you to come and speak to the Hawaii Dental Association on the very same subject. So I'm going back this coming January, January 2018, to speak to the entire Hawaiian Dental Association on this. And I think it's the first time that we're going to have a full day talk on SMART and silver diamond fluoride at a state dental association meeting. I'm not sure, but I think that's true. But anyway. Uh, Sydney was the inspiration, and then quit raise, risking. I said, right, right. I, I, we did this last night. What time was it? Really? <laughs> Risk, risking children's lives. There are no reported deaths from untreated dental theories in baby teeth. Kid, uh, kids end up in ERs with swollen faces, as Dr. Horst said. We don't need to repeat it. Kids die needlessly from general anesthesia and in office sedation, even when things look like they're going well. Sedation and general anesthesia are very dangerous to young children. Even if 10 children died from untreated primary tooth decay, <laughs> even if they did in the past 10 years, the number killed by sedation and, and GA in that same period of time would far eclipse it. Sedation and GA is far more dangerous than a young child's biome gone awry. The FDA just issued a warning against GA and sedation in late December 2016. U.S. Food and Drug Administration issued a warning that repeated lengthy use of general anesthetic and sedation drugs during surgeries or procedures in children younger than three years may affect the development of uh, children's brains. I was just very heartened to hear Dr. Post uh, emphasize this also. Thank you for that. So uh, we're all on the same page here, which is just so awesome. And I, I think Advantage is really leading the nation in this as, as a group. Um, Okay, Vancouver, in Vancouver, we had a four-year-old who died just this March. I mean, this is close to home, guys. It, the newspaper article read, it appears the use of general anesthesia was at play in the death. The off, this office contracts with a board-certified anesthesiologist to sedate children who come in for work. Anesthesia and deep sedation was used in this location more than 1,900 times in the past three and a half years. All that has to happen is once, one death, and you've got something that's terrible. GA with an anesthesiologist does not equal 100% safety, as we've been mentioning. Why not focus on ways like SMART to avoid sedation and general anesthesia? Contributors here are Dr. Jeremy Horst, Dr. Steve Duffin, and Dr. Doug Young. Whew. <laughs> 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 <laughs>